Well, good morning. It's good to be back uh, at Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas, the home of the Protestant Reformation in the free world. Uh, before I read the text this morning, uh, I ask uh, the elders uh, a couple of weeks ago to pray for the Portman family. I came to the class and asked you to pray, and, uh, and Stephanie Davidson sent me an email and said uh, that the various prayer groups around the chapel uh, specifically wanted her name because they wanted to pray for her, uh, Lanny Portman. Uh, we did pray. The people of Believer's Chapel prayed. And uh, her tumor was benign, and she's back in high school uh, to the praise and glory of God. Uh, if you really want to, uh, you really want to rub uh, fingernails down a chalkboard in front of me. Uh, it's to hear people say, you know, prayer really works. Um, really uh, grates on me. Uh, that's how everything works, by prayer. Um, so the people of Ch uh, Believer's Chapel brought God great glory and so grateful for your prayers. Um, the second thing I want to say before I read uh, the scriptures this morning is uh, I want to remind us all, Psalm 122, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, that's a command, and we are obligated to the commandments of Holy Scripture. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem of Jerusalem, God in His grace would bring peace in the midst of great suffering and great evil. And I join with David in praying Psalm 5, 4, break the teeth of the wicked. Uh, today we begin with our text, uh, chapter 15. Uh, verse 35, that's where we ended rather abruptly because I was too long-winded last time. Uh, our second lesson uh, this morning, and I'm going to give you uh, three texts that I want you to set a tab on. I hope you're taking notes. I take notes. I take notes because uh, I want to go back over and review and remind myself of what was specifically in a text. Uh, so I'm going to give you three texts that are going to supplement our lesson this morning. Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 6, so you don't have to go too far, and 1 Samuel chapter 10. And we find ourselves in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we're going to begin where we left off last time, 1535. So today it's lesson two of our new study, The Rise of David, a King Without a Kingdom. And today we are going to look at the two themes, the landscape of the spiritual lives of Israel, and the introduction to the plan. I specifically didn't say a new plan. It's the plan. What God is doing without any redirection whatsoever. So, here we begin our text this morning, uh, 1535, and the Lord rejected that he had or regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. 16.1, and the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have already now. Here is a key word, rejected. 
Why is it a key word? It's a key word because it carries the narrative. Think of a lake out here. Still, you have a little flower sitting on it. You say, there's nothing going on. And yet, there are currents spinning in that lake. That's a key word. Key words carry the narrative. You don't see them. They're subtle. They're just studded into the story. But they carry the story and they have a theology all their own. So, when we're reading narrative, we think of it like a geological formation. There's the surface and then there's another layer and another layer and another layer. And oftentimes these key words are down deep, but they carry the story and they're telling us and teaching us something. And this word rejected is a key word and it has a lot to teach us even beginning this morning. I have already rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn and go, and I will send you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have... Now here's second key word. Right here. It is the verb to see. You have found. I have found. I have known. It is the verb to see. And it's very important in our narrative. For I have seen among the sons a king for me. Verse 2, And Samuel said, How can I go when Saul hear, hears he will kill me? And the Lord said, Take a heifer and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3, And you shall invite Jesse, and I will let you know what you should do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I tell you. Verse 4, and Samuel did what the Lord told him, and he came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, are you coming in peace? Verse 5, and he said, in peace, to sacrifice to the Lord, I have come, and he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the feast. So here is our exposition this morning. We are talking about landscape, and we are talking about plan. And it's in the narrative. 1535, we didn't finish that text, and we shall do so now. And the Lord regretted that he had made King Saul over Israel. Why did he regret? Well, because of what Ezekiel, the prophet, tells us in 1823, that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, Peter picks up on that in the New Testament. But it's clearly an anthropomorphism. And I don't need to tell the well-educated Bible students of Believer's Chapel what anthropomorphism is. Uh, and particularly in Mark Newman's class. That's an insult. But I will just say anthropomorphism is applying or attributing a human characteristic to a quality of an eternal God. God is clear. He is concise. He has a plan. And not a new plan. A plan. And it moves forward. You know, that's why I wanted to set that tab at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. It's a wonderful text, and it will dispel any confusion that you have about anthropomorphism whatsoever. Uh, for all the peoples of the earth, he does his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. Now, we studied Proverbs for many years, and we talked about parallels. Remember? Parallel from one, the top line, to the second line. And 
It's either a way of redefining the same thing uh, in line two that we saw in line one, or it re-emphasized or codified uh, the same truth. That's what you see here. Look at the parallel. He says, the army of heaven, the inhabitants of the earth. They're parallel. He controls them. He's sovereign. He is the Lord of heaven and the earth in the same way, in the same fashion. And to be very clear, nothing can stay his hand or say unto him, what have you done? Why did you make Saul king? He's a dud. Why? Why would you do that? I think John Calvin helps us a lot here. God gives wicked kings to wicked nations. How about our politics today in our America? So, it is, um, <coughs> it is the Lord. It is the Lord ruling, reigning sovereignly over a people. And that's what's taking place. And God has a plan and we're moving forward. So, 16.1, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to grieve over Saul? See, the inference is a lapse of time. Notice the past tense. I have already rejected. There's our key word. I have already rejected him. That was rather quick and abrupt. Not really. Luke chapter 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, much is required. He made you king and you failed as king. Plain and simple. I want to talk about this word rejected. I want to show you how not only does it give us the temperament, the landscape spiritually of Israel, but how applicable it is to our spiritual lives even today. See, back before our lesson began in 1 Samuel 15, the people had come to Samuel the prophet and they had asked for a king. Give us a king like all the other nations. And it made the prophet furious. And the Lord talked to the prophet Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, 7, and his response to Samuel's anger over that request, and it's instructive to us. And here's what the Lord said. Don't take this personally. Now, they haven't rejected you. No. They have rejected me. That's our key word. Rejected. Now, here is an important text. 1 Samuel 10, 19. Before our study began, but we need to focus on this text for a moment. 1 Samuel 10, 19. The prophet tells the people today. What does he tell them? This verse really gives us the ministry a window into the ministry of a prophet. Why so? Because the prophet carried the message of the Lord to the people. It's like a mirror. We don't do that at Believer's Chapel. You don't come here to get a prophetic vision. No, we expound the Scriptures as they have been written and codified on paper. We expound them. There's no new revelation here. Look what the prophet does. He uses the very vocabulary that God had given him. That's why he repeats it. He takes the message that God gave him and he gives that message to the people using the same vocabulary. That's the nature of a prophet. Today, you have rejected. That's our key word. Your God, who has saved you from all your calamities, all your distresses, and said to Him, 
set a king over us. So let's think that through. Let's think through, first of all, what is rejection according to Samuel the prophet? Well, it's replacement, isn't it? Isn't that what God told him? They're not rejecting you, the prophet. They're rejecting me. It is something instead of. That's rejection. Now, here's our word, and here's how it helps us as believers even today. You see, when your king is invisible, it's easy to drift. That's Dan Duncan's word, drift, drifting, uh, complacent, get comfortable. I have a good friend who is now with the Lord, and he said to me, Many years ago, something I never forgot. He said, you know, our life is a life of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And God is never going to allow any of us to get comfortable. Why? Because we live by faith. Now, look back at 1 Samuel 10, 19. Look what they had done in their drifting, in their complacency. See, they had forgotten what he had done for them in the past. Look at the personal. Your calamities. Your distresses. And you fall into a trial and you panic and you forgot. You realize what the Lord did for you back ten years ago? Do you realize what the Lord did for you by saving your soul? Do you realize how the Lord has been working in your life all this time in your past? No, you forget that. It's what you do. It's what Israel did. They'd forgotten all those things. What did Moses warn the people about? Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. You are to remember, he said, how the Lord your God led you All these years in the wilderness. How did he lead? Tell us about that, Moses. He humbled you. He broke you. That's what he did. He snapped you again and again and again to train you. Train us in what? That you don't live by bread alone. I gave you manna in the wilderness. I provided for you all the way And you are not to forget that. But see, that's our nature. We forget. And then we're put into a trial. And then we panic. That's what happens. So God says, I'm never going to let you get comfortable. That's what I do. And invariably, here's what happens. God in His providence puts you into a dark trial and your bank account starts to thin out. And what do you do? You panic. Your health falters. You panic. The crisis comes. And your devotion changes. You you come to Sunday school. You go to the teaching ministry of the Word. But now, now you're going to stay for the Lord's table. You're you're going to start praying with greater frequency and fervency. You're going to get down on your knees for heaven's sakes. That's what you do. In other words, your devotion changes because of the providence He has put in your life. And uh, that's what happens. I had an aunt who was very skeptical of my conversion. She was all into work salvation. She really never wanted to talk to me about it. She just, you'd hear these little carps and criticisms along the way. And to my shock, I get the phone call because she had gotten the diagnosis. And here's what she said I'll never forget it. She was in a complete panic. I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me like you have never prayed before in your life. And that's the problem, see? 
the trial comes, the difficulty comes, and we panic. And uh, that teaches us about our temperament as believers every day. When you have to change your behavior because of the Lord's trial, you need to examine yourself as you are today. You need to make that change effective today while there are no clouds in the skies. You need to have that fervency with the Lord, that passion to walk closely with Him. Now, if that exhortation that I just gave you is true, then we should see it in the Bible, right? I mean, it should be there. That's why I wanted you to look at Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, it starts with the first word in the inspired language, Darius. Who's Darius? He's a new ruler that's taken over from Belshazzar. He, and he brings in a brand new government. High officials, new rulers, new laws, new regulations. Verse 3, then Daniel became. Remember that word became? It's a transition word. Telling us what? Daniel started somewhere. Now he has become. And the King James translates it preferred. You might have distinguished above all the officials. Now we know that that's the Lord, don't we? That that is not because he's the best and the brightest. This is God's plan for this man. And we know that because of our first introductory lesson last time. Psalm 57, remember? Uh, 75, Psalm 75 and verse 7. God is judge. He brings one down. He exalts another. So he has exalted Daniel, and we know that's part of the plan. That's what God is doing. Now, that brought trouble. The exaltation brought trouble. You never had any problems till you had money. You never had any problems till you became famous and popular. Uh, you never had those kind of problems. Now you got a whole brand new set of problems. Verse 4, high officials sought to find ground for a complaint, but they could find no ground for a complaint. So what do they do? They contrive and they investigate, but they found nothing. Sounds like Attorney General Ken Paxson, doesn't it? 16 counts of perjury, and he's innocent of all of them. So what do these enemies do? Very clever. Um, they create one, but it is a very interesting way they created it. It's all based upon the man Daniel, the way he is. They create an offense that he's going to, they know he's going to fall into because they know the kind of man he is. Uh, so I, about two weeks ago, I get all my winter rye planted. I'm pouring the water on it, and my fescue starts coming up. And I'm walking around my yard, and I'm so happy. And then one morning, I walk out, and there is a, like a 10, 12-foot area, and it looks like you had a PGA golf tournament in it. I mean, what happened to my grass? The divots are everywhere. I knew instantly. The critters, the critters had found the grub worms. They missed an area in my grub worm treatment that I pay for every summer in July. <laughs> and the critters, they smell, put their snoots on the ground, and they can smell the grub worms. They don't care about my fescue. They want that. They want that grub worm. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you set out your traps, 
But you don't bait the traps. No, you don't have anything hanging in there for them to smell, to run. No, you don't do that. You just get out the cages and you put them along a fence line or a, along a wall. Because that's what the critters do. They run along the wall. You anticipate where they're going to go. That's what these men did. Verse 7, whoever makes a petition to do any God, uh, for any God or man for 30 days, except you, Darius, oh, that didn't appeal to his ego, did it? Uh, shall be cast in the lion's den. Okay? So they anticipated, knowing the nature of this man, what was going to happen. Now look at verse 10. When Daniel knew, see that word? Knew? How valuable that is. He's got it. He's, he understands that the document had been signed. What was that document? Why, wow, that's, that's irrevocable. It's the law of the Medes and the Persians. Can't be done away with. So this man has now been picked up by his ankles and thrown into a dark providence. And what is this man going to do? He's put under a death sentence. What does he do? He does exactly what he's been doing. Exactly what he's been doing. Opening his windows toward Jerusalem, on his knees, worshiping, as he has always done three times a day. See, his providence changed. He is thrown into a deep, dark, life or death trial, but his God of providence does not change. And so he doesn't change at all. At all. Always zealous, always fervent. As the apostles say, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Our friend Mark and Cindy were thrown into a deep, dark trial at the beginning of this year. And, uh, and I got three visits uh, outside of ICU to visit with Mark. And uh, I found the same man it is a different context, but it wouldn't make any difference if I was at the ICU or at Believer's Chapel. I found the same man. And I would get in the car and I'd drive away and I would say, as I hit the steering wheel, that's the model. That's the model. That's what you need to grow up and be. That's the model. Always the same. Always the same. Mark wasn't teaching the class, but he was teaching me. This word rejected is teaching us. No, nothing pleasant, no good providence, no dark or deadly threat changes us. We are one in the same. We're always about our prayers. We are always about the Lord. We are always about Him. Why? Because that's where the power is. That's where the power is. Your daily walk with Him. Now we've set the landscape for 1 Samuel. See, Israel was just, they were just ho humming along, drifting. That's Dan's word. Things were routine. They had a good year last year. Having a better one this year. Anticipating even a bigger one next year. And what happens to you when that happens? Well, our text tells us you become numb to your history. You forget who you are and where you've come from. Um... Now you're anticipating blessing a 
apart from the Lord. And you lose the grateful heart and that spiritual numbness. And that's what had happened to Israel. It's not a new plan. It is the same plan. It is God's will, and here it is in 16.1. Fill your horn and go. If Madison Avenue has ever missed an advertising slogan, that's it. Fill your horn and go. Slap that on the back of your car, and you are really telling us something. There's no new plan. It's the same plan. It's God's plan. And it's moving forward. And He is not thwarted. And we are going now. Good. Where? Where are we going? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Yeah, uh, Bethlehem. You know, five miles southwest of Jerusalem. Bethlehem. Look, if you want to do something big in the state of Texas, you go to the financial centers. You go to Dallas. You go to Austin. You go to Houston. Bethlehem. That's like Snyder, Texas. <laughs> Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Selected specifically, said Bruce Walkey, by his mysterious divine initiative. Guess what you and I are? Selected specifically by His mysterious, divine initiative. That's what God does. He chooses the small. He chooses the weak. He chooses the insignificant. He brings one down, Psalm 57, 7, and He exalts another. That's what he does. He chooses a place with a history. Do you have a history? Let me tell you. For 19 years, I had a history. And when I got saved, people would say, oh, I remember you. No, you don't remember me. <laughs> no. no. Uh, he chooses a place with an ugly history. Judges 17, we have a guy by the name of Micah. And uh, Micah made an idol, a silver. Now, what did Moses do in the wilderness when you had an idol? Remember, he pulverized it, he put it in water, and he made you and me drink it. Think how sick that made you for two or three days to think about it. And uh, so this man, Micah... He makes this idol. And just as chance would have it, here comes a Levite from Bethlehem, Mr. Bluebird on his shoulder, and he's just walking down the road whistling. And Micah says, turn aside here. I've got, I want to show you my idol. Look, I need a priest for my idol. I want you to stay here and be the priest of my idol and I'll pay you ten shekels of silver every year. Now you've got a career decision to make. Hey, that isn't bad. Um, it's ministry, money, or money and ministry. And men have been compromising ever since. Here's what you need to know. What the Spirit of God is teaching you. The importance that someone puts in money should tell you everything about that ministry. Here's Believer's Chapel. 
the last formal thing that occurs under the leadership of these elders on Sunday is unannounced. They pass the plate. No horns, no announcement. Now we're going to pass the plate. No. Nope. Last thing that happens. The end of the day. Way down at the end of everything. It's ministry over money. That's what they're teaching you. And that's a great testimony. I want you to know. It's a great testimony. 1972, I walk in with an unregenerate father. He had never seen a place like Believer's Chapel. Oh, my goodness, this is like a kid at the county fair. He had never seen a church like this. People carry Bibles. He never carried a Bible to church. People carry Bibles. People actually read along verse by verse. Why, he had never seen anything like that. And where's the plate? He kept asking me, where's the plate? How do you give to this place? You got to pay for the lights. Somebody's got to pay for the air conditioning and the heating. How does this, how does this work, he would say. Really was a burr in his saddle. So what did he do? Well, unregenerate, but he felt an obligation. So he'd get out his little envelope and he'd write his check and he'd stick it into the, our, our viewing recording room over here on the side. Had the little window. He didn't get it. That's a testimony. That's a testimony to people, to unbelievers. We're different. We think differently. We act differently. God bless these elders for keeping it just that way. No, money and ministry are like oil and water. They do not mix. They absolutely do not mix. So what do you think this Levi did? Hey, he had a theological degree. We gave him a white collar. He walks around with a white collar all the time. Man, can he give an altar call. Woo! Boy. And raise money. My goodness, lock the doors. We're raising money. How else are you going to get something built around here? And so he compromised. God is not thwarted. Look at this. He sends the prophet to Bethlehem for a specific purpose. You see that word sent? That is so important because that's the plan. That's the plan. That verb, sent. He's under divine directive. And where is he going? He's going to Jesse. Jesse. Jesse, 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 Jesse. Jesse. Oh yeah, Jesse. Jesse from Jesse from Ruth. Yeah. Ruth and Boaz, their union together. And they have tiny Obed. That's the way the book of Ruth ends. And from that line, it's Obed. It's Boaz, it's Ruth, it's Obed, it's Jesse. Okay, yeah. Now I see. Do you see? Because that's the key verb here. That's our second key word. For I have, you have found, it is the verb to see. It's so predominant that Robert Alter, who is a really mean scholar, of the inspired language. He has written an Old Testament commentary on the Old Testament. He is an unbelieving Jew, but he is a knowledgeable man in this Hebrew language. And he said, this verb is so predominant, we need to change our English 
text to see. That's how predominant it is. For I have seen. Let's just think about that. Second Chronicles 16.9 His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to strengthen those hearts are committed to, to Him. I have seen. Now, look at this. It's very subtle, but it is a boxcar loaded with treasure. Look what he says he has seen. I have seen a king for me. Don't you run over those words. For me. What did the people say to Samuel? We want a king over us. A king for us. What does God say? I'm looking for a king for me. You know what the theology of the Old Testament is? See, we come out of the garden and we're looking for a person, a personality out of the garden. And God will plant those signs all along the way across the pages of the Old Testament. And one of those signs, a rather big one, comes in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 7. And it's Abram and Isaac going up the mountain. And Isaac's been there with his father. And he has seen over and over these sacrifices. And he says, well, we've got the wood. We've got the knife. But we don't have the lamb. Where is the lamb? 22.8. Here's the sign. Abram says, God will provide. Here's the translation. For himself. Don't miss that. For himself. The lamb. What's he doing? He's providing a king for himself. The prophet who grieved is matched by the God who provides. The God who provides for you every day. Don't you forget his goodnesses, his kindnesses that has carried you where you are this very moment at Believer's Chapel. Don't forget. Don't get numb to it. No. This is all about Him. Do you remember how He, he dismisses us in the New Testament? He says it this way. And you will be My witnesses. Mine. Throughout Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. See, it's all about Me. Not about you. I saved you. I saved you out of the fire. And now it's all about me. And the quicker you can get there, spiritually, emotionally, you will live a great life. A powerful life. Because it's all about me. It's not about you. It's not about your accomplishments. That's what He's doing. That's what He's teaching us. He is the God who provides. And so, verse 2, Samuel said, how can I go when Saul hears he'll kill me? I got no problem with that. Well, if he were really bold and full of faith, he wouldn't have that fear. Really? Here's why I have no problem with it, because the life of Christ is filled with dangerous and dark places, dark providences. It is a scary walk. It is not a yellow brick road to the wizard. It is a place where we have to be on our guard and trust God at all times. And this man is fearful. And this is the will 
of God for him. Don't miss that. And verse 4, the elders in Bethlehem, they're scared. They're scared because he shows up. I'd be scared too. Hey, just one chapter to your left, he takes Agag, cuts him up like a slice and dice machine at the county fair. Why wouldn't they be afraid? Why are you here? Why? Are you, is everything okay? That's where we are. We'll get into that. So, hey, look at how far we've gone. We've raced all the way from 1535, and we're right in the middle of verse 2, chapter 16. Hey, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'm not as... I'm not as accommodating with my words as Mark. Let's, uh, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for the Word of God that is teaching us on so many levels. It's teaching us not long ago and far away in the Old Testament. No, it's teaching us right here today where we are in Dallas, Texas, in our jobs, in our families, in our relationships. It's teaching, and we are listening, Lord. And we want, desire to be filled with that fervency and that passion and that consistency. In trial, out of trial, whatever be the state, we are fervent and faithful always to you because you, Lord, are a great king and we are your subjects both today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.